Mr. Palm Boss, tell me how. Hey, Mr. Palm Boss, let's do it now. Hey, Mr. Palm Boss, you're the one that makes fishing. So Hello, everybody. Bob Lusk, the Pawn Boss, checking in, in with you guys here on this Wednesday evening live broadcast. Got a pretty good show lining up for you today. We've got uh, Ty Cleave is going to be our guest here in just a couple of minutes. You know, uh, if, if you if you read Pawn Boss, you've read his stories recently. Man, that guy catches giant fish. If you get a chance to go to his Facebook page, check him out, uh, and he'll tell us a bit about his Instagram stuff going on here too. He's that guy, you know, Ty is such an, an entertaining and and cool guy. The it doesn't matter what the species is. He caught a giant gar this last weekend in the Trinity River watershed, and man, I'm telling you, that guy does some really really cool stuff. Now, normally as as I as I do, I, I see it on my phone. I got you, but I want to get it on my laptop so I can read the questions a little bit easier because they fly by pretty quick. Looks like we got a bunch of folks joining us already. Got 17 people on board, which that's really a good thing. The, um, you know, as as always, I want to be sure that you do a couple of things for me. If you would, there it is, I found it. And I've got the speakers muted. That's a good thing. Subscribe to Pond Boss Magazine. Here's my commercial. We may do this a couple of times. Pond Boss Magazine, $35 a year. Six times it comes out. We are the information central for anything that you want to know about your ponds or lakes. We'd love to have you join the family. Also, in turn, with our information, we've got all kinds of books. You want to build a pond? You want to know about what, what to look for in land when you're buying some property to build a pond? Or Mike Otto's book, Just Add Water. That guy, that, that, here's, here's his whole life. You know, he was, he was feeling pretty good about himself a couple of years ago when this book came out. He says, you know, feels pretty good to be an author. And I said, you know, it really does. And he says, yeah. And I said, uh, how's it feel being able to sell everything you know for 30 bucks? <laughs> Looks like we got Jason Nibstad, Tommy Davis, Brian Lawrence, Chris Lee from Kentucky. Now you guys know the drill. Some of you do, those of you that don't. Hashtag, in the comment section, hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Click like on the video and share the video to your timeline, and that will lead you into a drawing for a Pond Boss hat and a Pond Boss mug. Everybody wants one of those. <laughs> and also, anybody that su subscribes to the magazine in the next 24 hours, I'll pitch in a, a poster of, of sunfish. It's a pretty cool thing here. We got a bunch of these, and uh, be glad to share those with you. Looks good on a dock wall. For sure. So let me see. Let's see who all we got on here. We've got uh, Don Winterout. I noticed he subscribed to the magazine this week. Thank you. Troy Todd. Chris Lee. Steve Ryan. Hey, Steve. Glad you're on board. Dion Myers. John Henry. You know, so um, I'm going to invite Ty. Let me see if I can find it on here and invite him in to join us. There he is right there. Okay, Ty, I'm going to invite you. Bring Ty on camera. So here he comes. As soon as he accepts that little invitation, we'll have Ty join us. There he comes. There's Ty Cleve. Hey, Ty, how you doing, buddy? Good, Bob. How are you? Yeah, I'm still leading a pretty cool life, man. Looks like you're settled in I, there. That's All right. right. Good All to right. see you. Hey, good to see you, man. Let's have some fun tonight. You know, you All got right. Looks like we got a whole bunch of people joining up to uh, listen to what you got to say, man. That's that's very cool. You know, I was telling a little bit of people, tell a little bit about you to the people, telling you, you folks about how you go out and target big fish. And uh, man, we've got a bunch of our regulars on here. We've got Dick Tabbert. He's on. Very well aware of Dick. Glad to hear that. Yeah, yeah. He's he <laughs> he he catches a few fish himself, doesn't he? I know he does. Do you notice your buddy Steve Ryan's on there on here? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm excited about that as well. I just, just got done talking with Steve, planning another trip. Good for you. Where are you guys going? You know yet? We're going to Columbia again. Yeah, oh, that'll be fun. Yeah. Looks like we've got Trevor Romju. Kevin Johnson, do you na use oh, natives but... in your pond? Huh. You know what? Yeah, we do use natives. I I'd rather use natives a lot of the time. I, I presume that he's talking about uh, bass. You know, let's, let's kind of start the conversation off. What in the world intrigued you to go out and chase the biggest fish you can catch? 
Where did that come from? You know, I just think fishing is just an incredible sport. It's just so cool. And, you know, in every other sport that there is, you know, you, basketball, baseball, hunting, whatever else there is, you can always see your quarry. You know, and when it comes to fishing, in most circumstances, you can't see it. You're going 100% based off of your gut instinct and your own intuition. You're going based off of, of what you think. And, you know, you have to envision things in your mind that are happening underwater. And, you know, there's just no other sport that really compares to it, you know, to me. You know, just going so much off of your own intuition and what you're thinking and applying that to what's going on underwater just makes it such a cool sport. And, you know, as far as catching big fish, you know, that's just the target. You know, there, no matter how big a fish you catch, there's always going to be a bigger fish out there. You know, that <laughs> that's, me. that's part of what keeps you ticking, isn't it? <laughs> Keep you yeah. going. You, you yeah, know exactly. that that fish you catch, that can't be the only big one in there. There's got to be one bigger. Exactly, exactly. And I think it's okay to, you know, be happy with the fish you catch, but, you know, not, I don't really stay happy with it. You know, I only stay on that high for a little bit, and then I just know there's always going to be a bigger one out there, you know, and, and just trying to catch that next big thing is kind of what drives me. That's cool. Caleb Hunter compliments your actus deer back there. <laughs> oh, Caleb, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, I see Anthony Abate joined. Hey, Anthony, guess what? You're not going to believe this. Guess who won the drawing this week for the hat and the bug? You did. You are the winner. Be sure hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Click like and share this video to your timeline. So, Anthony, you'll be getting a hat and a uh, mug coming your way, and we'll even pitch in a, a, a poster for you too, buddy. Well, let's keep, let's keep things going on here. Good gosh, we got some new names. We got Joanne Pellafont, looks like, from Waynesville, North Carolina. Uh, Karen Wusher's joined. She's from Plano, Texas. Jeremy Griffith, Ty Cleave, you the man. Look at that. You got a fan Rock club up. kicking in, buddy. All right, so let's go fishing. Let's say, um, now, I, well, I'm going to back up a little bit. You've written several articles for Pond Boss, which thank you for that because it's very insightful. Gives a whole wow. other spin on things, the way people enjoy their ponds. Uh, one of my favorite stories so far is about you fishing in a rainstorm when you were a teenager. So yes. let's 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 start off let's start off with that. Tell people what you did there. That's a pretty cool story. That's actually one of my favorite memories of fishing of all time. You know, back when I lived in Nebraska, I had a pond that I would go to every now and then, and um, I went there. And the day was really clear. It was a really nice day. But you know, I started fishing. I started catching some fish. But I started noticing, you know, like you always do, clouds clouds on the horizon, and eventually coming closer, and very dark clouds. And just the closer the clouds got, the more fish I caught, and the bigger they were. And I just could not stop. I was just having the time of my life. And, and you know, it started raining. It started, it started getting really bad. It started getting really windy. And I just could not quit, you know. Like I said in the article, the, the tornado siren went off in the local town. <laughs> and my mother starts calling me immediately. And, you know, of course, she's freaking out. She wants me to come home. And I just could not stop. It was so much fun. I, I, don't, I never saw the tornado. Maybe there was one around. I continued fishing. I had the time of my life. And eventually, the owner of the pond had to come out and – you know, tell me I needed to leave just because he didn't want to get in trouble with his wife. But <laughs> that was so much fun for me, you know, and, and, you know, of course it was stupid. I should have left, but I don't really regret it. I had so much fun. And, you know, at this point in my life, now I realize I should have left, but I also realize, I realize why that happened, why those fish started biting, you know, when that storm blew in and the barometric pressure and the wind and, and the cloudiness and everything changing like that, you know, so that was, that was just an awesome experience for me. You know, the, the most fish I ever caught early on in my life was during a driving rainstorm like that. And, I mean, it just seemed like when that front blew in, the fish were turned on. And I didn't, it didn't matter that day I was catching fish. So, I, I guess. Exactly. Hey, we exactly. got the, one of your buddies there, Jory Kutu. Is that how you say his name? Yeah, that's my buddy from back in Nebraska. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says uh, there's a story between you and got you and he. Looks like you helped him catch one of his biggest fish ever. I did, I did, yeah. He hasn't gone fishing much, but I took him fishing once, and I think it was his first or second cast. He caught like a six-pound bass and just blew his mind and blew mine as well. That was a lot of fun, George. Well, you know what? Let's let's go through some of your techniques, if you don't mind sharing. Let's, uh, to start off the conversation, and one thing I want to really drive home to everybody is, is you're, you're not just a bass fisherman. I mean, I've seen some photos of you. You have 100,000 followers on Instagram looking at pictures of giant fish that you've caught, right? So you'll catch the biggest tarpon you can find, or you might even go catch the biggest bluegill in the neighborhood. So sure. let's just, let's start off the talk about 
just give people some hints, maybe not so much on how to catch the fish, but what's going through your mind when you're scoping out that neighborhood body of water or in, you know, our, our fans' cases, their ponds. What do you do? Take, take people through that thought process. In my opinion, you know, fishing is really, is really two sports. It's crazy when you're fishing, you are the prey, but you're also the predator. You know, as the angler, you are the predator because you're holding the rod, but you are also the lure, and as the lure, you're the prey. And so there's two very different dynamics there, and being the prey and being the predator is almost two very different sports. You know, so the, the first thing I try to think about when I'm fishing is remove myself from the predator situation because the predator part begins when you set the hook, when you feel the bite. Until then, you're the prey. You know, you want to look, you want to think about your lure in the water, think about what it's doing, and think about what you can be doing to making it be more like prey. So I always try to kind of remove myself from what's going on above the water and place myself in what's going on under the water and 100% be the prey. Think from the prey mindset and try and figure it out, figure it out from that end of things. Do you think people try to overthink that? Yeah, I think in some cases they really do. You know, um, there's so many lures out there, so many different techniques that you can do. You know, but at the same time, I, I try to keep things as simple as I can and just, just focus on what's going on under the water, and that's it. You know, what's going on above the water really doesn't matter much at this point. You know, cell phones, whatever else is going on in the world, I'm just trying to focus on what's going on under the water. You know, think about your lure and imagine your lure under the water and imagine that fish you're trying to catch and just trying to put it all together. You know, it's an equation, I think. Okay, let's go this way. I noticed Fred Bingaman a longtime friend and Pond Boss subscriber is on board here. And Fred lives on, on a childhood property, a pond that his grandfather and father built. And Fred's now in his 70s. And he's a, an astute pond manager east of St. Louis near Brownstown, Illinois. And it's about three acres. And he knows he's got some six to eight pound bass. Now, bluegill are the main prey. You know, he's got a few, uh, just some topwater minnows, things like that. You know, mosquito fish around the edges. But bluegill and red ear are his main prey. And this pond is, is, is shaped kind of like a, um, a teardrop with a cove coming off the side of it. If you were going to sure. go try to fish that pond to try to catch the biggest bass in there, and you just walked up on it for the first time, stood on the dock and looked out there, what, what would you say? What would you think? What would you do? Well, to start with, you know, you kind of got to think about a bass in any pond. The biggest bass in any pond has got that pond figured out incredibly well. You know, she's got a system. She's got her way of life. She's got what I would like to call a comfort zone where she knows exactly what to eat, when to eat, where to eat, and how to catch it. And she's really going to only eat things or do things that fit into that comfort zone. So she's got that pond completely figured out where she knows exactly what to do. So why would she eat your lure? that doesn't fit into this system of hers that she's got figured out when she doesn't have to. You know, if she can rely on the bluegill, if she can rely on the red ear, why is she going to eat your spinnerbait or your crankbait or your worm or whatever it might be? You know? Those fish are so smart, and they have the pond figured out so well, and that's why they're so hard to catch. You know, and, and like you said, the bass is eating bluegill, the bass is eating red ear. You know, in my opinion, you throw that, you throw something like that at it, something that it's already eating. You know, those, those fish, they know exactly what they want. You know, and, and the, 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 that bass probably knows exactly what point to eat at and exactly when she's going to get her next meal. You know, she's got the pond figured out. And so one of the best ways to catch the biggest fish is, you know, figure out exactly what they are doing and then, then mash that. You know, sometimes you don't really have to fool the fish completely. If you can catch that fish on that pond in a spinnerbait, you fooled that fish. But if you can make that fish eat something that looks just like what it's already eating, <laughs> went out of its comfort zone to do it. Yeah, this it's is what it naturally does. So how do you present that giant bluegill swim bait you've got right there? Well, on, on, on like the pond you're talking about here, it sounds like, like he knows his pond very well, and I'm sure he knows what points to hit. He knows exactly probably where those big fish are. He just hasn't quite figured out how to catch them yet. Start running really big lures by those places, by those ambush points. You know, start using the big blue, bluegill swim bait or, or even a big worm or a big lure. You know, the average bass lure is designed to catch average bass, you know, and, and I think that in order to really catch those bigger fish, you need to think about throwing a lot bigger lure. You know, say, I, I almost, say you, it, you throw it. I'm going to stop you there. Say that again. You said average lures catch average fish. Absolutely. You know, you go to your, Beat that up a little bit. That's real yeah. important. 
you go to Shields, you go to Academy, you go to every sporting goods store, look, they have five inch worms. They have three inch creature baits, you know? Um, they have tiny crankbaits. You know, those those lures are designed to catch average fish. You know, you think about almost almost all advertisements for bass fishing is directed towards a tournament angler. A tournament angler is trying to catch five fish a day. He's trying to catch five three pounders a day or four pounders to win his tournament. He's not trying to catch double digit fish. You know, and um, to catch six, eight, ten pound bass, you know, you kind of need to think. You, you need to find lures that that those fish want. You know, they're not looking for a three inch, three inch creature bait. They're not looking for a five inch worm. They're looking for something that will actually help them to grow and help them to thrive. And in most cases, that's that's a big swim bait, a big worm, a big jig, a bigger crankbait. You know, the literally the bigger the lure you throw, you'll be amazed. You'll stop catching those one and two pound fish, which to me is a good thing. You might only get four or five bites a day in your pond, but they're going to be bigger bites. Big fish eat big meals. Exactly. Man, I can't yes. tell you how many times I've been in the electric fishing boat. And uh, matter of fact, somebody asked a question on the Pond Boss Facebook page today. You ever shock up anything unusual? And yeah, we do. We shock up anything from from nutria to alligators, depending on where we are. You know, to I shocked up a fifty pound buffalo one time that I thought was a was a we hit a barrel and turned the barrel over. You know, but the thing that's intriguing to me is what we find in the stomachs of some of these bass. I, I remember shocking the lake two or three years ago over near um, oh, um, Monroe, Louisiana, 30-acre lake over there, and we shocked up this five-pound bass, and its stomach was just huge. And we put the fish in the live well, you know, as we do when we're going along, we're dipping the fish out. And when we got ready to process the fish and weigh up and measure, when I say process, I mean weigh and measure and take notes. I look in the live well, and that one big bass that upchucked about a 14-inch long cottonmouth water moccasin. It's crazy. You know, so it's weird, weird stuff. I noticed Bob yeah. Wisher says, match the hatch. And that's pretty much what you're saying, is if you can figure out what the main bait fish is in your body of water and then imitate what you think the biggest bass is going to eat, you're going to stand a better chance of catching that fish. Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes, makes perfect sense. Anthony Abate, our, our drawing winner today, he says, the biggest bass I ever caught was on a one-pound musky bulldog. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. There you go. Exactly. Um, I think there's an equation that bass or even a lot of predatory fish do when they see your bait, and they're trying to figure out if the calories that they burn to get to that bait and to kill it are going to be worth the calories they get from consuming that bait. So, for instance, if, uh, if a uh, the 10-pound bass sees this swim bait, you know, five feet away from her, she's probably going to burn more calories getting to that bait than she's actually going to get from consuming that bait. But if that 10-pound bass sees this swim bait, you know, <laughs> five or ten feet away from her, it's a completely different deal. She knows that the calories burned to get to that bait and to kill that bait are going to be worth it because she's going to consume so much more than she's burning. And that's instinctive. You know? That's instinctive in those fish. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And I not gonna, you know, people will catch 10-pound bass on a tiny lure, but in my opinion, the reason that happens is because that lure was worth it to them, meaning it was right in front of their face. You know, they didn't have to move for it. They're not going to chase something if it's not worth it to them, and if that lure is right in front of their face, that's the only time it's actually worth it to them. You know what I mean, Bob? I do. I do. I do. I see that. And really, the only reason they're going to hit it at that point because you irritated them enough to make them want to bite it. Sure. Exactly. And that's really it. You know, when you're, let's, let's you live uh, near Houston, in Houston, so you spend yes, quite a bit of time pond hopping, and you fish in some community ponds and park ponds and irrigation canals and things like that, right? Absolutely. Any water I can find. <laughs> All right. So any anytime you go up to a new body of water and you're kind of scoping it out, you know, we talked about what you would do at Fred Bingman's pond, but if you were, I mean, you're going to zero in on this bigger fish. How many casts does it take? to catch a giant fish once you figured out that there's some big fish in that body of water? Oh, boy. Um, I guess that would just depend on the pond and depend on the day. You know, if, if it's a really windy day in Texas and it's it's springtime, like right now, for instance, I think I could go to a new pond and know within a day or two if there's big fish in there because it's springtime, the fish are moving shallow, and say if we have a storm, I can find out in a day if there's big fish in there. You know, if it's the, if it's the middle of summer, of course, it's going to take me a lot longer, but I'll, I'll look for I'll look for culverts coming into the water, or I'll look for drop-offs or lay-downs or whatever I can find. 
and I'll just I'll just kind of pick it apart bit by bit and try to figure it out. You know, in some cases I've gone to a pond and, and caught a big fish on the first or second cast, and sometimes there's still ponds I haven't caught big fish from. You know, maybe they're not in there, and maybe I haven't figured it out yet myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now when you uh when you when you're scoping out that body of water and you're not getting that strike on that first forty casts. Are you changing techniques? You changing baits? You changing your retrieve? What are you doing? You know, back to kind of the tournament angling thing. You know, everybody talks about being an adaptable and a versatile angler. You know, and um, maybe to be honest with you, that's not my strong suit because you think that in forty casts, if I don't get a bite on this lure, I'm going to put it down. You know, in some cases, I can go two or three days throwing this one lure to get one bite. And that being said, when I do get it. I know it's going to be a big fish. So maybe I, I kind of subscribe to the school of, of more persistence and trying what you know works and trying those, those big fish proven lures as opposed to just switching lures all the time. You know, my tackle box might have four or five lures in it that I trust that I know will work, and I kind of just use those most of the time. Okay, I love that. So now let's kind of switch gears. Talk a little bit about some of the giant fish you've caught and just your thought process with that. Where I'm going here is – are you thinking the same when you're catching that seven foot gar like you caught last weekend? Or if you're going to go try to catch, I see Bobby Rice from the East Coast is on. He, he grows some snook. He says the snook in his pond love to eat tilapia. You know, now here's Tory Rhodes. Tory comes on off and he says topwater frogs or topwater bluegill imitations. Let's do that. Let's go that direction. He's asking topwater frogs or topwater bluegill imitations. Which do you prefer? I normally use topwater frogs. I think topwater frogs are, are a far better bet. You know, when bass eat a frog, when a huge bass eats a frog, they come up below it and they slurp it down. It's literally sometimes barely even a ripple on the water. Normally, if it's a bluegill imitation, they'll kind of crash it. They'll, they'll smash on it. And, and the difference that that tells me is that when they eat the frog, they're very confident in it. The frog's normally not going anywhere. If a frog's on the surface of the, surface of the water, it's kind of a done deal for that bass. A frog on the surface... It's a pretty easy catch. Whereas a bluegill on the surface, that's a faster fish. You know, that can get away really quickly. I think bass have a lot more confidence eating frogs than they do bluegill. Normally when a bass eats, eats a frog swim bait, it's in the back of their throat. You know, you got time to set the hook. And, and I haven't had that same kind of success with bluegill swim baits. Ah, so they're going to suck that frog down. Okay, let's go back to the question I asked you a while ago. And when you're, when you're chasing, like, on the Trinity River last weekend, I'm, a, I'm presuming that's where you caught that giant gar. Yes, sir. When you're, when, when you're chasing those big fish of different species, are you using the, kind of the same thought process? Or are, you, are you going in different directions based on that species of fish? Well, I think there's a lot of anglers who just try to catch the biggest fish they possibly can. You know, Steve Ryan was watching or is watching. And, you know, that guy, I, I've been talking with him and, you know, there's just a lot of people who they have the mindset of, of I don't really want to, I still want to catch all, as many fish as I can, but I really want to target the biggest fish that I can. And I think that's just the mindset right there is, is just really knowing what you want to catch and, and trying to catch that one fish. You know, don't fish for fish. I don't like to fish for fish. I'm just fishing for one fish, for one bite, no matter what I fish for. <laughs> okay. For alligator gar fishing, you know, as opposed to using a small rod with 50-pound line, and you know a little three ounces of bait i'm using a, a head off a carp that was eight pounds you know, i'm using 150 pound braid using a lot heavier gear you know and i'm setting myself up for that and the sacrifice is you fish you fish for three days and you get one fish you know what i mean and when you catch that fish you better be ready <laughs> exactly it's, it's just having that mindset of, of you know that you know it might not happen you know, and, and if it does happen, it's going to be epic, but it might not happen. It might not happen. And then when it actually does happen, it just blows your mind, you know, and it's so much better than catching however many one pound fish, you know, or, or 20 pound gar or whatever it might be. Right. We got some pretty heavy hitters to join us. Gato Ventura is on board as well. Jim Morgan oh, from Kingfisher. We are going to get you to Kingfisher. We yeah. better. <laughs> so, you know what? I'm so ready. I'm so ready. Yeah, that's a it's a cool, very cool place. So when we get to Kingfisher, that lake is 125 acres. The deepest water in it's 13 feet. There's thousands of bluegills that will weigh anywhere from half a pound up to a pound and three quarters, and hundreds that are two pounds. And there's a legitimate chance to catch a three pound bluegill. 
But you're going to have to figure that's, that that's out. All I, heard, all I heard was three pound bluegill. That's all okay. I See, I love that. So t talk to me about that. Oh, man. Um, talk to you about bluegill fishing or what in general? Yeah, yeah. Talk. Well, I mean, you know, I think most people that are watching this show grew up catching bluegill. And to this day, that's my favorite fish to catch. I'd, I'd rather catch a bluegill than anything else. I love to stand yeah. on my dock with my grandkids and catch, you know, seven, eight, nine inch bluegill all day long. So when Absolutely. we go to Kingfisher, and you're going to be chasing those three-pound bluegills, what's your thought process that's going to set you aside to be able to catch those three-pound bluegills that other people might not even know exist in that lake? I have that'll be a that'll be a, an equation that I really have to figure out. My thought process is is that what I don't know a whole lot about bluegill fishing to be honest, but from what I have learned is that. Bluegill like things to fall right in front of them very slow. They prefer to, to eat things coming from below and eating up. And so what I want to try and do is I want to throw a bigger lure, like a, a one and a half or a two inch minnow or cricket or crawdad on a very light jig head is what I want to try. I think that a yeah. lot of people for bluegill with like a one thirty second ounce jig head or a one sixteenth or a beetle spinner. Those are, those are bigger lures. They sink fast. You know, and to me, to fool the biggest bluegill, I, I, I want to discourage the one one pound bluegill from eating my lure. I can't believe I just said that. I want to discourage <laughs> the one pound bluegill from eating my lure by throwing something bigger, yep. like a two-inch crawdad, and I want it to fall very, very slowly right in front of their face. And I think that might be what it takes. You know, you, you get the big lure, you get the slow fall, and uh, that's what I want to try. That being <laughs> said, when I get there, who knows what will happen. Yeah. I just want to get there, Bob. Yeah, we're, hey, we're going. We're going. I just got to get some dates set up with Jim. Jim's watching. He knows. But I've been talking with him. Yeah, right, We're going to get right. that figured out. Yeah, Troy Todd says, any tips on catching hybrid striped bass? Oh, man. I have not caught a whole lot of striper or uh, striper hybrids in my life. But uh, the last ones I caught, it seems that Wiper, for some reason, really likes smaller crankbaits. And, and I, I normally fish with bigger lures, but I've caught some big ones with small crankbaits. My absolute favorite thing to do is normally, if you have wiper, they're normally eating shad, right? And um, a rattle trap, a white rattle trap, or a white jig with a twin tail grub on the back is what produces the best for me. And if you can find the wiper and you throw that jig in there, you know, and you work it up and down like a dying shad, I think that works really, really well. I would throw the lipless bait to find the fish, and then I would throw the white jig to catch the fish once you found it. Okay, so there's a pretty good tip right there. Job one is to find the fish. So, but yeah. there, now there's like, a difference. If you're going to go to Lake McConaughey in western Nebraska and try to find hybrid stroppers, that's different than going out in somebody's 10-acre lake that's been growing hybrid stroppers on fish foods the last four or five years. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, now in, in a pond with hybrid striped bass, you'd be, or wipers, you'd be looking at different techniques than you would if you went out to a McConaughey or, a, you know, or a, like a Lake Buchanan in central Texas where they are. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, be sure, be, be sure people know that. In the pond, you can start with the jig. You couldn't do that in Lake Mack. You know what I mean? Yep, I get it. Let's see here. Here's Gerard Urbanozo. Urbanozo, what lure did you use to catch that monster payara? He's asking. <laughs> oh, give me a second. I'll pull it up. <laughs> and by the way, while you're doing that, Jim Morgan just said uh, hello to us. And uh, he asked, how would you go about catching that giant bluegill? Well, you, you just told that. We're going to, Jim, we're going to get some dates set up where we can get some folks over there and, and uh, do that. All right, what do you got there, mister? This is a Rapala Magnum. That's what I used to catch that, uh, that big pyre. You can see this hook is, this uh, eye right here and this attachment to the lure is bent from what that pyre did to it. But, yeah, that was a lure. There's, uh, there's so many teeth holes in it, lure just got wrecked. But uh, that was the lure. Tell people what a PIR is and where you were. Where, where did you go to do that? I went to Colombia, uh, South America, mm -hmm. with a group of nine other guys. And um, the PIR are, are uh, they're a vampire fish, is what they're called in America. But they're like yeah, a, they're real weird. They're real weird looking, aren't they? With those teeth yeah, coming up from the bottom. They're kind of overgrown piranha, but a lot more streamlined, and they have two huge fangs coming up from the bottom of their mouth. It's it's yeah. my profile currently is a pyara, but they yep. sit in super fast moving water. So you throw your you throw your lure, you throw your crankbait in those rapids and you know, in ten seconds it's downstream 
you know, so you really got to act fast. And those fish hit really hard in that passing in the water. And it's a crazy fight. It was a lot of fun. So a lot of things I'm hearing you say is you, you, you have kind of got an innate ability and learned ability to, to analyze that water and what to do to attract a bite of that species of fish and the biggest ones there. So that, that's, well, think, that's your deal. Let's see. I have a lot to learn. <laughs> what was that? I think I have a lot to learn, but that's what I'm, that's what I'm shooting towards, I guess, Bob. All right. Let's see here. What uh, Justin Singleton's asking a pretty good question. He says, what live or cut bait do you prefer for trophy sized catfish? So if you're going to go try to catch a giant blue cat or a flathead or what, whatever, what, Talk us through that a little bit. For flathead, I would use I would use live bluegill, but I don't know a whole lot about flathead, so I'd like to focus on blues. But for blues, it's a no-brainer to me. I want to get the biggest shad I can, and you know, a ten-inch shad, and cut it into either quarters or cut it into thirds. And the head is going to be my favorite bait to throw out there. And then how do you I, fish that? Yeah. Just throw it on the bottom. Yeah, I, I just I use. A lot of people do it different than I do, but fishing in ponds, there's no need for a weight. A weight is just something that that catfish is going to see, something you don't need. I just straight line 20-pound fluorocarbon, or if there's structure in the pond, 40-pound mono, straight to like a 7-aught or a 6-aught big river bait. Mm -hmm. It's basically a, a modified J-hook or a modified circle hook, excuse me. Yeah, circle hook. That is to have the most scent that you could possibly get out of any bait, in my opinion. And that's what I like to do, especially if the wind is blowing and you can place your bait in front of the wind, that, that wind's going to be blowing the scent of that shad all the way throughout that entire pond. So you can, you can even place your bait in shallow water, but if the wind is blowing, it's going gonna, it's gonna to push that scent all the way through the pond. So I always think about the wind and make sure that the, the wind is pushing my scent throughout the entire pond. Love it. Love it. See, now that's a, that's a pretty important tip. Because right there, when you cut that shad in the thirds and you got the head hooked onto that circle hook, there's an aroma. There's some pheromones and blood, and there's scents coming from that fish that's making its way down the current with the winds. And, and that senses that, like, you no know, blue cat are ultimate predators. They're, big, they're a bigger predator than the largemouth bass. Yeah. You know? So they want to eat meat, and that's what they're going to do. But when you here. cut the blue shad out and it hits the water, you can watch the slick and all the oil from that shad dispersed throughout the water and when you throw a bluegill cut bait out there it doesn't do that at all chad are the oiliest fish in fresh water yeah. just they're loaded with fat you know they they glean their food matter of fact gizzard shad are fatty and they make living off the bottom they're, they're feeding on the bottom they're bottom feeders that's why they call them a gizzard shad people they have a gizzard so they break mm -hmm. things up and they feed on the bottom here we got another question here um matt errington asks any tips to get a better hook set on topwater frogs and bluegills. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Um, the first, I've seen, I've, I've seen a lot of people when they fish, they set the hook the second they see anything happen when they're using topwater, and uh, that's that's a detriment in my opinion. You know, when a fish gets a topwater lure, in most cases, the fish is trying to kill it. The fish has got to kill it before the fish eats it. So that initial massive explosion is normally trying to kill it not necessarily trying to get it in its stomach so when a fish hits that top water lure i just stop don't do anything just stop and watch and normally you can see your line start to go down if you do indeed have that fish if she indeed has that lure and if she doesn't then you just stop and let it flow back up and maybe she'll come back for it but but what the second it goes down i'm going to point my rod tip directly at the fish and i want to reel up the slack that i have and when i reel up the slack there's going to come a point when that that Right, right before my line is pointed directly at the fish, but when there's still a tiny bit of bow in the line, I want to go straight up. And since I started with my rod tip straight at the fish, my hook set literally goes all the way back. I'm burying that hook because I'm, I'm pulling that rod through like seven or eight feet of air. I'm burying that hook. So it's important to go all the way down, reel up the slack, and then go all the way up. And, and with a, a topwater frog, you, you have a little bit of time. You know, everybody says set the hook immediately. With topwater frog, it's a soft bait. That fish is trying to rearrange all the moss and everything else she got when she's attacked that frog in her mouth and just keep the frog in her mouth. You have a second there to do what I just said. Point the rod tip at the fish, reel in the slack, and set the hook. Excellent. Another thing, Excellent. if you're using topwater frogs, 100% necessary to use braid, in my opinion. Braid uh -huh. has zero stretch, and you need that to bury those hooks into that fish. Because you don't have any slack and no play. Exactly. That's it. Right. Let's see here. Um... 
Jason Nipstad from North Carolina says he goes by Kingfisher all the time. Well, okay, well, we got the point. We're going. Let's see, Austin Purdom is a young angler uh, on a high school team here in Whitesboro, Texas. And he says, green spike it on a Zoom speed crawl, tear the bluegill up. Explain what that it. means. I'm assuming that's a, uh, that's a garlic attractant. That's um, chartreuse. Yep. And he's putting that on the tails of the craw, I assume. But that being said, that's a three-inch lure. So if he's catching bluegill on it, at least the, the Zoom craws I've seen are three-inch lures. So he's catching massive bluegill, if that's the case. Love it. Let's see. And then Austin follows up with this question. He says, any, any peacock bass or any Amazon perch? So you've been fishing in South America. Let's talk about some of your experiences there. What's happened there? Oh, man, South America is, is just an awesome place to fish. You know, I would really, really recommend it. Um, the peacock bass are an insane fish. You know, they hit incredibly hard there. And they're, they appear to be a very spunky, almost angry fish. You know, and when you get bit by a peacock bass, Normally, you don't really, you, you can't set the hook because you're just holding on in a lot of cases. You know, they just hit that hard and they, they hit and they run away, want to run away from wherever they were when they hit. And so you just have to hold on really, really tight. Um, they fight, they fight super, super hard. They don't fight for a really long time. You know, the biggest peacock I caught, high teens, it fought so hard it terrified me and then it was at the boat and then we caught it, you know, so. <laughs> So if you, if you do go there, which I would highly recommend planning a trip, if anybody wants to know who to go with, by all means, you know, send me a message. But, yeah, you, you, you just – you need to use at least 65-pound braid for peacock, and you just got to hold on. You know, they're crazy. The, uh, hold on. Top, every, everybody thinks about the, the peacock bass with those giant topwater choppers. You know, that's uh, actually – I have one here. There. You're the only person I've ever met that sleeps with his lures. <laughs> <laughs> okay, That's so the, that a, and a, that lure just rips through the water really, really fast is what a lot of people use for peacock bass. But uh, fair warning, if you do go, those bites, they, they do happen, but it might be three hours before you get a bite. You know, you might get one or two of those hits a day. And granted, they are going to be a lot bigger fish. You know, that's the sacrifice you make. You can catch a lot smaller peacocks by throwing like a smaller x wrap or, or a quick moving jig or you can use that lure and have a good shot at a at a high teens or a 20 pound fish excellent we'll take a minute remind people bond boss magazine 35 dollars a year go to info right send us an email info at pondboss.com or call the number there 800-687-6075 we'll get you hooked up and uh we just also got our new resource guide in so anybody that subscribes in the next 24 hours, 35 bucks, will pitch in this resource guide, which is a, a, we vet our, our vendors and we vet our advertisers. So we want to be sure that they're rock solid folks. And if you subscribe in the next 24 hours, you get a resource guide. The first issue of the magazine, which Ty Cleave has an article in, by the way, and then a, 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 a poster of the fish. So let's see, we got, uh, looks like Chris Blood is on board. Chris works with Texas Hunter Feeders and is an avid fisherman. Matter of fact, he spends some time in South America as well. Tell us about um, just, just some of the general thinking about seasonal changes, weather pattern changes, and how that affects which baits you might use and how you use those baits. Go through that a little bit. Well, the article that I just wrote kind of had a lot to do with seasonal changes. And to me, one of the most important things is fishing is the rate of fall of the lure that you use. You know, going by how fast your crankbait floats up or how fast your, your lipless crankbait sinks or your Texas rigs, how fast they sink or how much silt they, they disperse on the bottom. Or I, I fish a ton of jigs. How fast is my jig sinking and is it in line with what's going on in that pond? You know, in the dead of winter, Texas or Nebraska or Minnesota, you know, regardless, the water's, the water's cold for that region. And whatever's going on in that pond is going on very, very slowly. So down in Texas, I'm not going to want to throw a three-quarter ounce jig to those fish. That's going to that's gonna sink to the bottom like a rock, and it's going to stir up a bunch of mud. I want to throw like a one-eighth or a one-quarter ounce lure for that colder water temperature. You know, and, the, and just like for bluegill, I would want to throw a lure that just barely sinks in that super, super cold water. And just as the spring is warming up, you know, I'll, I'll bump up my lure size. I'll bump up the weight of the lure I'm using. You know, all of a sudden, if it's spawn, 
want my lure to be a little more active, be on par with like how the crawdad and the bluegill are acting in that pond. So, so as goes in. as goes the temperature, so goes your approach and and the technique you use. So when it gets cold, you're slowing down. When you think you're going slow enough, you go slower. Yeah, exactly. And not only slowing down, but making sure that my lures are falling that much slower because yeah. everything else in the pond is moving at that slower rate as well. Yeah, and there's a little bit of a tease. This article coming up that'll be in the May-June issue that, that uh, Ty has written is called The Rate of Fall. And that's a, that's a huge deal. So let's dwell on that a little bit. Let's say, um, you know, most people that are watching you here have got private bodies of water and they everybody wants to be better anglers. So how would you take that the practical side of rate of fall and talk through some of the different lures to really expand on that idea, how people can use that in their bodies of water. Sure. Um, I think that everybody likes to use a Texas rig lure. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. You bet. So I would, if, if it's the dead of winter, if it's cold, colder, cold in Texas, we'll say that, I want to use like a 1 16th ounce or even a 1 8th ounce bullet weight on my Texas rig in the dead of winter. You know, the, the bluegill in that pond, the shad in that pond, the crawdads in that pond, they are, they're moving very, very slowly. When you're pulling that lure along the bottom and you pull it up off the bottom, you want it to fall back just like everything else in that pond is, you know. But as the water warms up, say those fish move from the deep winter haunts to staging points to spawn, and you can think about they're more active. They're, if they're preparing to spawn, they're actively hunting, and you can start throwing lures that, that have a little more action, that fall a little bit faster. You bump up to the 3 8 ounce. And, you know, as, as the fish, maybe they're post-spawn, the water's warmed up now, and they're post-spawn, they're hungry because they're done spawn, they're trying to recover, they're hunting even more, then you want to bump up to, you know, a three-eighths or a half ounce, you know, just, just gradually getting bigger and bigger as the water gets warmer. But that being said, there comes a point when those bass are completely out of post-spawn where it's too hot, and you almost go back to throwing more, more subtle lures because those bass are all of a sudden lethargic from the heat instead of lethargic from the cold water like they were in the winter. So what I just heard you say, and I've, I've seen this as a fisheries biologist, each species of fish really has a prime operating temperature. Largemouth bass, for example, their favorite temperature ranges from probably the upper 50s to the lower 80s. If you get much cooler than that or much warmer than that, and their behavior totally changes. Exactly. So what you're saying is pay attention to temperature. Yes. Figure out where the fish are and think like the biggest fish if you want to catch the biggest fish. Yeah, exactly. Another point, um, just a, a lure to, to think about for a lot of people. I know we've been talking about frogs a lot, but think about the fact that most people who fish frog lures fish them on top of the water. But in reality, bass eat a lot of frogs underwater. You know, whenever you, you scare a bass off the bank, it makes a little, or you square, scare a frog off the bank, it squeaks, it jumps in the water, you can see it, you know, go in the water and burrow. A, an incredible pattern to throw when you see frogs start doing that is a is a bright green jig in a half ounce or a three quarter ounce. You literally cast it onto the shore. I have casted lures onto the shore before and seen fish rush the shore to see what just happened on the shore. They can feel whatever's going on on the shore. Cast that lure on the shore and you pull it off quickly. It's just like a frog hopping in the water. I use a bright green jig with like a noisy trailer. And you can catch a lot of big fish doing that. They think that frog is just burrowing in the mud and they kill it before it gets there. I love that. You know, one of the things I, I sort of preach to people is that, just take a bass, for example, they're only going to bite for three reasons. They're hungry, or they're defending a nest, or defending a territory, or you cause them to react because you hit them in the head with something, or you, you invade that space for that moment. Do you buy into that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that a lot of fish eat because they are angry i think that some of the biggest fish that you catch like i've talked about a lot of these big fish they know what to do in that pond they're not only existing in that pond they're literally thriving in that pond and they they know how to thrive in that pond they don't necessarily need to ever eat your lure so the, the, really the way to catch a lot of those fish is to just make them angry you know get in their space and, and really in other for lack of better terms piss them off make them want to do something about the fact your lure is in their in their space and you okay. know a lot of people a lot of people fish fast they fish crankbaits they fish spinnerbaits or even if they fish a texas rig it's in and out of that space in a quick period of time in my opinion i don't want to do that because none of those lures are aggravating that fish because they're not staying in in her area long enough to really piss her off 
if you've got a spot in your pond where you know a big fish is sitting or you think there's a good chance of it, throw in there repeatedly and keep your lure in there for a long time. The longer it stays in there, the more aggravated she gets and the more she feels she's got to do something about it. And I'm not even talking about spawn. I'm just talking about, in general, that fish has her favorite ambush point. That's where she likes to stay. Anything in there is going to aggravate her. It's like slapping a fly when it comes on your shoulder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just bother you because it exists. You know, it's just there. You know, uh, one of the things, I want to switch gears. I see Chris Bloods asked a pretty cool question. I want to transition into that. You know, fish have different senses. Some fish are sight feeders where they, they got to see what they eat. Catfish, for example, have got taste buds on their whiskers. I remember an old catfish fisherman when I was a kid said, hey, if you're going to catch a catfish, don't set the hook when you're getting the bite because what's happened is that catfish with his whiskers under his chin is bumping your bait. And if it tastes good, then he'll eat it. So wait till he runs. So what he'll do is he'll bump it three or four times, maybe five times. Then you'll feel your line go tight. And then when he runs, then set the hook. So fish have senses. You know, the catfish can taste it. Bass can see it. But all fish have a lateral line that allows them to sense movement or noises. And I think that's something a lot of people don't really think about. You made the point a while ago about the frog coming, you know, throwing a frog up on the shore and a fish coming toward it. And then you bring that thing in there. If that fish is five or six feet away and it's intrigued, it can sense the motion in the water. So here's yep. Chris's question. He says, you may have already covered this, but what's a good lure for bass in murky water? So you're really, when you have murky water where you're trying to catch a fish that likes to feed by the way it can see, how are you going to entice a strike where, you, where the fish can't see? Well, you know, I've caught blind bass in both eyes that were like six or seven pounds and incredibly fat. So, you know, that kind of tells you all you need to know about, about the lateral line of a fish. You know, and, and one of my favorite things, uh, the, almost all fish I've caught that were blind and that big came on a, a chatterbait, which I guess I don't have handy, but it's, it's a bladed jig pretty much. And it just causes an insane commotion in the water. You know, those fish are 100% going for a lie on their lateral line for feeding and, and in some cases if it is a muddy place maybe you can't fish really slowly if you don't know where those fish are maybe you can't fish slowly and in that case you know a chatterbait will really get their attention a square bill crankbait like a strike king 2.5 or a 3.5 a big crankbait that just has a wide wobble it doesn't make any noise but it doesn't need to just that insane wide wobble will really really draw fish in and they're really well aware of it because that sends a little bit of a vibration that fish can sense it you know, from a fishery biology standpoint, one of the cool things that I've learned and figured out over time is like a school of thread fin shad where there might be 5,000 fish in that school is, is moving across the water. A fish 35 or 40 feet away senses that is one big fish. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's moving in unison is carrying a, covering a bunch of space. So, But when they go investigate it, you know, that's when they come up and blow up on it. So now yeah. you come across some top, let, let's say you're out fishing, and you see an eruption on the surface, and you want to catch the biggest fish there, what do you do? I don't think that the biggest fish are causing that eruption in most cases, especially if it's schooling bait fish. I think those biggest fish are under those bait fish, and they're kind of waiting for the easy pickings that come from the injured, injured schools. Um, if I see fish busting on the surface, I like to throw a lipless crankbait at them. Because number one, there's already a lot of vibration in the water, so the lipless crankbait isn't, isn't too much. Sometimes... A big spinnerbait or a lipless crankbait just by itself can be too much because it's so much vibration, so much going on. But if there's already that going on in the water, then you have that going for you. And you can work that right through that school. But the important thing is let it drop below that school. Always work that crankbait up and then let it fall right back under it. You know, and if, if you can see those shad, you see them doing that, just like with the wiper lure, throw that white jig in there. Anything falling below that bait, as long as... As long as it doesn't get hit by the one and two and three pounders on the surface, the bigger fish will be waiting under that school, and that's when you can get those bigger fish. That's exactly where I was going with that. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've been in my electrofishing boat and see some schooling action, and just because I want to know, you know, for giggles and grins, I'll go yeah. run over that school, and invariably there might be 50 largemouth bass that are 10 to 14 inches just chowing down on those shad. But if you sit that, let the boat sit there for a few minutes, that's when the bigger fish will float up because they're much, much down, further down under, the, under that school. Another thing regarding a lateral line and water displacement is, is 
it's crazy to think about, but that that's a pretty big lure, right? Would you agree, Bob? Heck yeah, yeah. That, in my opinion, causes just as much water displacement as your crankbait might because it's pushing so much water. Look at that tail. Look at how, how big the body is, how big the head is. That's causing just as much displacement as a, as a crankbait is. You know, and I think fish can feel that as well. So don't be afraid. Instead of throwing chatterbait or spinnerbait or some other noisy lure, if you throw essentially what's a silent lure to us, that's a very noisy lure to a bass. And it's very, very natural, far more natural than a crankbait might be. Because it displaces if quite a bit of water. Fish, yeah, even if a fish cannot see this, it can sure feel the thump of that tail. And I think that, that in that those muddy water situations, you get bigger fish, you know, th try throwing a big crankbait. Sorry, big, spin, big swim bait. <laughs> That's good. So, so when you come up on that school of shad and, and the little fish are erupting on it, do you head over there because you think you can catch a bigger fish underneath that school? Yeah, I think so. It's just, you know, the, the fisherman in me is obviously going to be drawn towards that. Yep. You know. But, and the, uh, and those, those big fish are looking for a big meal, and if it's a five, five six, seven-pound largemouth bass, and they roll up on some 10-inch bass, they're going to eat them. Yeah. yeah so yeah. that's good. Here's, a, yeah. here's, a, here's an interesting question, and we're going to switch gears, it looks like. Sheridan Ashmore says, how long does it take a body of water that went through a dam repair with new habitat? I'm talking about Okmulgee, PFA, and Georgia in particular. I'm going to take one minute and, and respond to that. Well, uh, we've, seen, we've seen some really fantastic things happen with lakes that have been drawn down, whether it's on purpose or in a drought. For example, Lake Buchanan in central Texas, all the highland lakes, you know, they were anywhere from 30 to 70 feet low. Lake Travis down around Austin in that area down uh, along the uh, Colorado River. But during that five-year drought, there was all kinds of willow trees and vegetation and stuff that grew up in the lake bed. And then when the lake filled back up, that flooded brand new habitat. And then the next thing that happened was the forage fish, it's exploded. Threadfin shad, gizzard shad, bluegill, you know, red ear sunfish, minnows. And now the follow-up, here we are, I think three years after that drought. And now so the tournament weights are going up. You know, it's a 25 pound string wins a tournament. So you got to have some big, big, big fish. Jim Liner just showed up. Sorry I'm late, had to work extra. Well, I'm glad somebody has to work. So now when that lake fills back up, it's probably two and a half to four years away from providing fish like it did when it was a brand new lake. So be excited about that lake because it's going to, it's going to be a stud lake coming up. Let's see here. Dick Tabert, back in the day when I did bass fish, I used a spinnerbait but stained water. We used Colorado blades for the vibration. So talk about how you're going to choose that, you know, based on the, just when you roll up on a brand new lake, let's say that uh, we blindfolded you and said, we're going fishing. And we roll up to a lake where the water is, is fertile green. You can see maybe a foot and a half. And it's a fairly windy day, and you're seeing some points, and you got a boat. What are you going to do? I would start with a search bait just to boost my confidence a little bit, like uh, a chatter bait, a lipless crankbait, or a spinner bait. And I would I would do that until I caught one or two fish, until I saw how they looked, you know, how fast they were, how healthy they were, and, and what they were eating and whatnot. But to catch the biggest fish in that pond, I would try and find a point where the wind is blowing on and I would dissect it with a big worm and with a, with a jig because I, I can tell by how the water's blowing and I can tell by just if there's fish in there, I can kind of tell they're going to be on that wind blown point. The feeding fish are going to be on that wind blown point. You know, there, there's no reason for a fish to be in the wind where it has to, where it has to burn calories to stay even where it wants to stay except for eating. You know, there's no reason a fish for a fish to burn calories unless it's going to be worth it to that fish. And it's only going to be worth it to that fish she's eating. So I would find fish on those windblown points and I would get those bigger fish by fishing slower and fishing with a jig or a worm on the bottom. So you're, you're kind of taking advantage of what that fish is conditioned to. You just got to get a little bit of confidence to know what it is for that particular body of water. Yeah, exactly. That what you're saying? All right. So let me, let's, let's stay with that topic. Uh, I bet you've got some ponds around you where you know there's some giant fish. Can you go catch the same fish over and over and over? Big fish? Maybe in some cases, you know, the the big fish I've caught hovering around 
you know, the biggest fish I've caught, I think, was around 13 pounds and then a handful around 9 to 10 pounds. I have never duplicated that with those fish. I have not. So no, that, thir um, that 13 pound bass, you caught it, you know it's there, but there's not a chance you're going to catch it again. But I mean, maybe there is. I think, I think that there is, but uh, to that point, let me, let me dive into what needs to happen for me to catch those bigger fish, I guess, you know, on, I kind of, I kind of wait to strike until I feel like conditions are absolutely perfect. You know, I talked before about a bass having a system where they know exactly what to eat, when to eat, where to eat, and how to catch it. Now, they're very, very comfortable with that. But um, say it's, it's, been, it's been a week of, of nice weather, of stable conditions. Those bass are so deep into that system, they're very difficult to catch. You know, barometric pressure is high, the sun's shining. They know what they're doing. They've got it all figured out. But let's say barometric pressure drops. You know, it's springtime, a storm rolls through, a storm drops a bunch of rain, you got wind, you got rising water, water's getting muddier, you got barometric pressure dropping, you got all these variables happening to that pond. And what that does to that pond is it throws those fish off their system. All of a sudden, they don't know what to eat, when to eat, where to eat, and how to catch it because the water's two feet higher, the water's dirtier, the wind's blowing, the bait are in a different area. So many things happen to that pond with that storm coming in to where those fish all of a sudden they don't have a comfort level at this point. You know, they have to somehow maintain their body weight, but everything that they just knew is out the window. They have to adapt to these new circumstances. And in my opinion, that makes that giant 10, 12 pound bass that knew that pond incredibly well, all of a sudden she doesn't know it so well, she has to adapt. And that can make a fish that is not opportunistic all of a sudden become very opportunistic. Because it, it, so of, you, the, change, you changed, the, the environment changed her circumstances. Exactly. And that, you can really capitalize on that as an angler. You know, in my opinion, those fish, all of a sudden, they have to eat. They have to maintain their body weight. And they can't eat shad on their favorite anchor point in four feet of water because it's all of a sudden six feet of water and mud. So what do they do? They become hungry. You know, all of a sudden, you can catch that fish throwing a jig or throwing your swim bait or whatever it might be. You know, the biggest fish that I've caught, if, if, if we were to have another perfect storm just like we had last year when I caught the 13-pounder, I bet I would get a fish of similar size again. It was just, it was, it was beefing up for spawn. Those fish were just feeding so much. Then you threw a storm on top of them. They got to eat. They're going to go shallow in the, in the barometric pressure. It's done, you know, and it's, I'm not going to pretend like I'm a great fisherman because on, on your average sunny day, I might not be able to go out and catch an eight or a nine pound bass. But as soon as it storms, my confidence is through the roof. I know those fish are going to be feeding. I know they're going to be in a different mindset. They're going to be opportunistic because everything that they knew in their world just got turned upside down and they're going to eat. And they have to because they, they have to change because the circumstances change. Yeah. They're not complacent they, anymore. Yeah, they're used to a constant meal. They're used to maintaining that heavy body weight and they have to find a way to do it. And your lure is the best way to do it, you know, if you can present right. it right. Mike Rivers asked the question here. It's a good one. He says, uh, do bass get gun shy of a lure that gets presented to them all the time? I really think they do, you know, I think that they get, I think condition is a, a good word for that. You know, um, if a bass gets caught on the lure once, I think she, maybe she can imprint that and remember that to a certain extent. You know, it's just like all fads with lures, you know, whenever the lipless crankbait came out, can you imagine what happened? You know, your first day fishing a lipless crankbait, and that fish have never seen before, you know, it's going to be crazy. But then all of a sudden, they'll kind of figure it out. They'll get conditioned to it. And I do think that they can, they can kind of get used to certain things. Yeah, it's a Pavlov's dog deal. There's a, one fishing club way back, way back in the 80s that I worked with that had a lot of pressure on the lake. It was about a 60-acre lake and, and 100 and something members. And somebody was out there every day. Those, mm -hmm. I know those fish got hook shot. So what we yeah. did was we closed the lake, you know, a couple of days a week. But what they did was they started buying bait fish, and what we do is we take a fish truck, and we go to every corner, and we dump a few bait fish in the corner, and that completely changed the way those fish acted because that was a positive reinforcement where the lure yeah. is a negative reinforcement. Let's yeah. see here. Jim Liner's, uh, Jim Liner worked, worked for Ray Scott for a long, long time over in Pit Lala, Alabama, near Montgomery. Says he's been nailing six-plus pounders on a chatterbait this month with a water temperature 62 to 66. Here's a real good question, and I'm going to save, uh, Sean, I'm going to save your question for later. I'm going to 
respond to that one in writing. But Sheridan, this will be the last question. Sheridan Ashmore, is it true that there are bass that stay shallow through all four seasons of the year? That's a great question. I'm sure there is. Probably not. Probably not in the northern states. If we're talking Texas and Georgia and, and Alabama and southern states, absolutely. But I think that those big fish that stay shallow all year long are males. Males are the buck bass, the one, three, four, maybe a five-pound male. They, I don't think that, that, like I said, they don't have that system figured out like that really big fish does. And a, a, a big fish, a giant bass, a 10, 12-pound bass, needs to be comfortable. And that, that for a big fish to be very comfortable, those giant fish, 10, 12-pound fish, you're really only going to see them shallow in the spawn when they absolutely have to come up to spawn. And then they don't necessarily want to be there. They're doing it because their instincts is telling them to. The second they're done spawning, they're going back to deeper water. You know, I, to you, you I totally agree with that. The uh, one thing we've learned, we, we radio tagged a bunch of fish and went to South Coast State University. And in the hot part of the summer, those bigger fish that we radio tagged would not only be deep, they'd be in the thermocline, not sitting above it. They'd be in the thermocline where the oxygen levels are low but not so low that they'll suffocate, but where the water temperature might be five degrees cooler. So they were looking for, for cooler, cooler temperatures. Ty, hey man, thanks for hanging out. Tell people how they can find you and look at some pictures of giant fish. Oh man, I have a YouTube called Ty Pig Patrol. I have Instagram called Pig Patrol and Ty Pig Patrol. And then Facebook is just Ty Cleave. Um, yeah, find me on anywhere of those places. And uh, any more questions anybody has, I'll, I don't know everything by any means. I got a lot to learn, but I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, you can you can send them to my my inbox on Facebook. Outstanding. And if you subscribe to Palm Balls Magazine, you'll see Ty's articles. Ty, great hour. It flew by, buddy. I really appreciate you. It really did. Us. It's already done. All right, buddy. We'll be talking to you soon. We'll get a date set to go up to go to Kingfisher and go catch some big bluegill. I'm counting on it. All right, buddy. Talk to you later. See you later. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next week at 6.30 next Wednesday, 6.30 Central Time. So until then, adios. Thanks, guys. See you.